Uh, let's get started. So I want to welcome both John and Krista to the webinar. Thank you so much for uh, participating uh, in the webinar. And um, I know both of you are going to give a, a bit of an overview on a specific topic area. And then we are going to open it up for a Q&A for clients as well. Krista, I think you were going to make some opening comments or John, which, which of you? I can start. <laughs> so yeah, in the wake of this COVID-19 era, um, we're definitely having to get a little creative with how we're handling estate planning. So different challenges are coming up related to meeting with clients, of course, and especially with signing documents. So that's one of the things we are going to talk about today. Of course, we're trying to engage as much technology as possible and um, doing most of our meetings with clients virtually. And there's some different options that we're looking at and doing in terms of signing powers of attorneys and wills and healthcare directives. So, yeah, so my name is Krista Clendenning and I'm an estate planning lawyer with Tradition Law. So this is my bread and butter, the work that I do every day. And over to you, John. All right. There we go. And my name is John Poyser, and I am a lawyer as well with Tradition Law. And I've been doing nothing but estate trust work for 30 years, 35 years. I'm getting so old. And um, over that time, I've had a lot of opportunity to help families with wills and, and powers of attorney. And I've got the privilege of practicing with Krista, who's doing a great job and works in the same area I do. I've started to do a little bit of litigation, but I still do some of the actual planning work, which is helping people set their affairs up so everything goes smooth as silk for their family when they pass away or if they're incapacitated. One of the things I wanted to talk about during my brief period at the beginning of this session is some of the mistakes we see. And some of the mistakes are just simple, stupid mistakes. We get the chance to see a lot of different wills. We get to see wills done by other law firms. We get to see them because we're litigating about them. Or we get to see them because people come to us and they bring us what they've already got. We also get to see them because we do a lot of what we call will reviews. Financial advisors send a will to us and say, look this over and tell us if you find anything wrong. And then they share it with their clients, the service we provide. Through looking at all of those wills for all of those years, I've seen some terrible mistakes, mistakes that are just there through pure inadvertence. I've seen uh, wills where people try to give their estate to themselves. It says, I, John Smith, when I pass away, this is my last will and testament, and I want to give everything to me, my spouse. I actually says, my spouse, John Smith. So I've seen that two or three times people trying to give their wealth to themselves. It's clearly a clerical error, and it can be fixed after they're gone, but it's expensive and difficult. So it's a stupid error that can be avoided. If I had a nickel for every time I saw someone try to give out, different mistake, if I saw a nickel, if I had a nickel, for every time I saw someone try to give out 125% or 150% of the estate, I'd have a lot of nickels. It's a will which says I give 25% to person A and 25% to person B, C, D, and then there's an E. They're giving out 125% of their estate. Stupid mistake. It shocks me that these things don't get caught. It shocks me that, uh, that people don't read the documents more carefully before they sign them. I think it's because people rely on the lawyers to get it right. And it shocks me how often lawyers don't get it right. So if you've got a will, a will document, if you've got a will, at some point in time, kick it out and read it carefully to see if it does what it's supposed to do. Warning, lawyers fill them with gobbledygook. The will you read might be full of all sorts of language which was developed in the 1800s. Sentences which go on for paragraphs, uh, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 words. They're hard to read. If you can't read it, you should have someone explain it to you. Because you might have one of those wills that contains a stupid, simple mistake that the lawyer didn't catch and it's going to bite your family. So we see that, and that's something that uh, people should be wary of. We also see a lot of situations where the will itself reads fine. There aren't any silly or stupid mistakes in it. But what the will does is it fails to adequately address the special circumstances that present for the family. And let me give you some examples of that. A family might be a farm family, and there are special tax rules which allow farm property to be passed to, to, farm, to, to the next generation of farmers while avoiding capital gains tax. And it's important to take advantage of those tax opportunities. Failure can uh, cause the loss of a family farm. Family, uh, uh, another example would just be something like a uh, family corporation or a family business. Um, the succession of that family business can be smooth as silk if it's dealt with carefully on a considered basis as part of an estate plan. A lot of individuals have a family business just have a simple will saying divide everything equally among the kids. 
not really taking into account that one of the kids is active in the business, and there is a general expectation that the business has to be kept on as a family business. Other examples, a disabled child or disabled beneficiary. If a person has a disabled family member and they want to leave their wealth to that disabled family member in some measure, it can be done the right way or the wrong way. The right way preserves access to government income support and government programming. The wrong way loses all of that. The right way makes sure that the money is carefully administered for the lifetime of the disabled person, and it's always there as a financial backstop. The wrong way doesn't do that. The right way is smooth and simple. The wrong way is a terrible headache and headache can sometimes interfere with the life of the disabled heir. Um, other examples would be uh, citizenship issues with U.S. citizens. If you've got a U.S. citizen named anywhere in your will as a beneficiary or as an uh, executor, that can be a real problem. There are things that can be done to avoid those problems. And that's another family situation that can suggest or require special planning, special clauses in the wills. And we get the chance to see a lot of wills. As I've already said that. And a lot of the time we see families that have those special circumstances, but the lawyers weren't sensitive to the idea that there's special circumstances requiring special planning. And those wills create real mischief for the families. The same kind of mischief is a wrong name. The same kind of mischief is trying to give out 150%. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's not a simple clerical mistake, but it's a mistake nonetheless because it doesn't adequately provide solutions and tools to deal with special issues. So... Uh, that was my uh, my way of saying that wills are not only important documents, but it's important they be done right. And if you've got one already, take a hard look at it. If you've got any of the special circumstances I described, make sure that those special circumstances were carefully canvassed with a uh, lawyer who knows what they're doing. If you want a full list of all the different special circumstances that apply, because that only means three or four, that could be provided to just ask on to get a will review done and we can take a look at uh, uh, we'll send out a list of issues and allow you to go through it and check the ones that might apply to you so there you go i said i would start out by talking a little bit about wills a little about the mistakes made in wills and then turn it over to krista so krista turning it over to you sure so another document that's very important to you is a power of attorney So a power of attorney will appoint a personal decision maker for your finances and your property. And that person will manage your assets during any period that you have lost your capacity to manage your assets for yourself. So I'd say the number one consideration um, for your powers of attorney is making sure that you are appointing people that you trust. I'm sure John has seen this over and over in different litigation matters that Um, You know, people that get appointed that are either fighting with other family members um, or don't have your best interests at heart, uh, there are obviously some really big issues that come into play there. So appointing people that you 100% trust because they're going to be responsible for financially looking after you during however long that period of incapacity lasts. In terms of um, common errors or errors that come up with powers of attorney, uh, the document itself Um, While it does have a number of standard powers, so lawyers tend to use standard powers of attorney with different powers in them, it should be taking into account your specific circumstances. So if you have any special forms of property, you might need a special power to deal with them. Um, One example would be digital assets. So if you had something, um, some sort of digital asset or account or something that you would need your attorney to be able to access and manage if you ever lost capacity, Um, then you've got a power in there that shows that they have the authority to access that account. Uh, Another example of something that should be included in your power of attorney that's tailored to you was something John also mentioned earlier. Um, If you are, have like a dependent, so if you are supporting an aging parent, if you have a disabled child or sibling, there are special um, supports you might be providing to those people. As a regular rule, your attorney can only use your money for your benefit. So if you want that support, that financial support to continue to those people, you would have to include a specific power in the power of attorney for them to be enabled, being able to um, provide financial support. Um, Other examples with that would be any gifts uh, to family members or donations to charity. If you wanted those to continue during your period of incapacity, powers would also need to be included in the power of attorney for that. 
So sometimes people aren't aware that uh, there is that rule there for their attorney to only use their money for them. So that's important to be aware of and to tailor it if needed. Um, other common mistakes, the people that you're appointing, um, if you've got people outside of Canada, so a common thing that comes up is family members that are resident in the US, there's certain reporting requirements that they have to the US, even when they're just named in the document, they might not even be acting for you yet. So we, as a general rule, try to avoid appointing those people, um, but there's workarounds if that's kind of the best option that you have. Another piece would be homestead rights. So Manitoba has a specific provision that you would need to include um, if you're a spouse living with a partner. So there's a homestead provision that's got to be in that power of attorney and making sure that that's in there if you're a Manitoba resident is also important. Uh, there's other things you can add in there. Um, compensation of your attorney, if that's something you want to ensure happens that uh, when that person steps into that role and they could be acting for years, uh, if you want to make sure that they are compensated, you can include a provision for that, otherwise they will not be. Another important consideration would be thinking about uh, what property you have yourself, and this applies to wills as well. So um, if you are appointing an attorney to step in and manage your property, they're only going to manage your property. So if that property is actually held in a corporation, then by virtue of the power of attorney document, they don't have that automatic authority to access property that's held by the corporation. It's gonna be the directors that have access to that. So it's just things to turn your mind to. Um, and another piece would be joint property. So sometimes people forget that, um, you know, by appointing an attorney, yes, that attorney has access to your joint property, but so does that other person that's joint on the property. So good things to keep in mind when you're thinking about your assets and who's going to be having access to them and helping you with them. So I think, John, do you have anything to add to, to that uh, list? One of the things that uh, a lot of clients have asked us to do over the years is add a specific provision that details and deals with the prospect that they might be incapacitated. Let's assume you have a stroke or you get Alzheimer's and you're unable to handle your own financial affairs. Um, you might want your money deployed in a way that's going to access the most support you can possibly get. You might want special people to come in and help you in your home. You might want to stay in your home as long as possible. Um, we have special language which we've used for a lot of different clients, which say, keep in my home. Keep, if, if, so long as that serves some uh, lifestyle benefit to me. Spend the money necessary to bring in outside help, uh, nurses, um, companions, people to drive me around, people to take me shopping rather than to shop for me. Do all of that, even though it's going to deplete my wealth in some measure. Without special language to that effect, you'll discover that the attorneys who were appointed either don't spend the money because they're, uh, they're trying to keep it use, uh, the, the money out there for... for for the people who ultimately will inherit from you. Or uh, I don't spend money because they're afraid they're going to get attacked by other people who will say, stop spending money so, so quickly. <clears throat> by spending that money, you're uh, depleting the, the, the wealth unduly. But that is a very personal thing. A lot of people are really afraid of being stuck in a personal care home, in a bed where they couldn't instead be using their wealth at home to make them, or in a supported living environment, to make them comfortable and happy for as long as possible. You need special stuff in your power of attorney if you want those kinds of special arrangements to be made. So that's another issue. Sean, what if you uh, to the treatment? I think you wanted to ask questions and to... Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, can you... I've changed mics. Yeah. Is this better? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. better. I've got about 30 different mics in my office, so I happen <laughs> to put the wrong one. Okay, so here's a... I just want to expand on your on your comments. So, Chris, I'll start with you. Now, in terms of the um, who to choose as your power of attorney... Um, we've always defaulted to this notion that it really should be someone on the ground, local, um, that can do those day-to-day -day kinds of things. But what's been your experience over the years? I mean, we're dealing with Zoom today, technology's changed things. Is it absolutely a prerequisite or we sometimes see situations where a local person is not as easy to find? Do you have any comments on that? Does it, can it work to have remote people? Where does it work well? Where does it not work well? And you need really someone on the ground to help out. For sure. So I think we do see more um, 
people being appointed like out of province. Definitely would want to keep it in Canada uh, if you can. But we do see that. I mean, with technology today, you know, a lot of things can be set up automated. So if there's bills that have to be paid, those can be set up with the bank. Um, and all can be done by phone or online. Um, so it is a lot easier today uh, to have those people acting um, from another province. Where you have more issues are maybe if you're dealing with selling properties, like, you know, when you actually are stepping in and um, having to deal with some things that are really, you know, on the ground. Um, so I think that that can cause more complications. But no, it is, it's something we're seeing more of. Um, and the other thing we do is I'll say we can appoint people in succession. So if there's a person that's here on the ground first, we can name them first, but then have those alternates that are maybe in another province um, as backups if, if needed. Okay, perfect. You know, one of the things that um, I, th I think, John, you can confirm this, uh, with regard to executorship, there is a, a I guess you call it, I, I would call it a tariff. I'm not sure if it's a tariff. But there's actually compensation built into uh, paying executors for what they do. But on the power of attorney side, I think, Christy, you said that on compensation, that needs to be actually built into a customized power of attorney document to contemplate that, right? Compensation to power of attorney. So if you're asking me, first of all, the idea there is that under a will, an executor is always entitled to compensation, whether the uh, will says that or not. It's part of the law. The trustee acts as the executor is entitled to reasonable remuneration. Still often useful to put a specific clause in the will saying what that remuneration looks like, because otherwise it's pretty vague. There's no formula. It leaves the, the executor having to negotiate with the heirs and potentially go to court. So there's always a right for, to remuneration as an executor but it's still useful to have a clause. With the power of attorney, you need the clause. Without the clause, there's no automatic right to uh, compensation. So when we're doing powers of attorney, we always say, should we put a compensation clause in? When we're dealing with will, wills, we'll generally ask the same question, not because it's necessary, but because it's still something people should direct their mind to. And uh, they can have a better will having a compensation clause in it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, Question on uh, came up on the use of trust as it relates to um, estate planning, John. A um, number of years ago, the, the tax treatment of uh, inter vivos trust or, te or ten testamentary trusts had changed. Um, but trusts are still being used. And what are the typical, the main things you're seeing in the field, and this could be both for you and Krista to, to address. What are the main things you're seeing people using trust for through their, their will plan or estate plan? So let me speak to that first, and I'll let Krista speak to it second. Um, you're quite right. The tax rules changed. It used to be that we could save families uh, lots and lots of money every year after someone passed away by building special tax plan testamentary trusts. The rules have been changed, so that's no longer available. It, it, it was a shame. It's something the Liberal government did shortly after they came into power. Having said that, trusts still have a very important role and are commonly used in estate planning. One of the most common circumstances where trusts are used is in a blended family situation. And that's where we have a husband and wife and children, but the children are from an earlier relationship. So the husband might have a couple of children from an earlier relationship and a new wife, not the mother of those children. When he passes away, he might want to ensure that his wealth is available for the support of the wife so that she has a, a, a financial security and economic power for the rest of their life, but he might want the wealth to ultimately go towards his children. In that case, a trust can be used. It's called a spousal trust. The money passes from the husband's dead hands into the trust, written into the will, and the trustees written, named in the will take care of that money for the rest of the spouse's life before passing it on towards the children. A very common tool, a very important tool in a blended family situation. And actually, when I was describing at the beginning of this presentation, when I was talking about the special issues which sometimes present. A blended family is an issue which often presents. You've got to do a careful job dealing with a blended family to make sure that the children aren't fighting, are not fighting with the step parent. We see that so much. Half of the litigation that we have is typically stepchildren, step parent, squaring off and fighting. And a trust is one of the tools that can be deployed in a specialized will, in a sophisticated will, in a, in a carefully thought out will, which will avoid that. Another common example, leaving 
spousal trusts aside. Another common example where trusts are used these days is dealing with estate planning for the disabled. I'm going to let uh, Krista speak to the use of a trust for a disabled heir. Sure. So that's something I do a lot of, um, is planning for persons with disabilities. So there's a certain type of trust that we commonly use called a Henson. And these trusts are employed in estate planning for people that are planning to leave their wealth to persons with disabilities. And the reason they're so important is because uh, the people with the disabilities generally are receiving EIA from the government. And if they receive a large inheritance, they're going to be kicked off their EIA which doesn't just cut off their financial support, but it affects their housing, the other programs that they're in. So it's uh, extremely detrimental to their lifestyle. So what we do is set up a trust. Um, so that money, the inheritance that that child will be receiving gets put into that trust. There might be another sibling managing that trust. And then the, the money is like effectively housed in an exempt, um, an, ex, an exempt asset. So the trust isn't treated as a personal asset uh, for EIA um, for EIA purposes and that person that person with a disability still has access to that money from the trustee who's managing it and the trustee can make distributions as much as they want um, for that individual to support them to pay for those add-ons over and above the EIA that they're getting so the Henson Trust is a really great strategy um, and provides great benefit for family members with persons with disabilities I'd say another uh, trust benefit that we are still using is planning around um, the creditor protection and potential marital breakdowns. So we often use trusts um, when, so when there's no disabilities, but maybe parents that are worried about their kids, um, whether they've even, they're even married yet or have spouses yet, maybe they're just entering that stage or maybe they're well within it, but they will leave their inheritance for their, for their kids into trusts. And the goal of holding it in that trust for each child is that um, there's some creditor protection there. So um, the trust can be managed by that child or by two of the siblings. And because that total control isn't with uh, the individual child, it's not subject to marital property division if, if the couple ever breaks up. So it's one way to kind of keep it exempt also from that uh, marital property sharing. Mm. You know, when we, when we talk about estate planning or powers of attorney, I didn't say this in the preamble to our discussion today, but it really is part of an overall planning approach. I mean, estate planning is one piece of the overall financial plan, but it also denotes the importance of, of family conversations. I think the, the power of attorney and the estate planning trusts, because um, we've had clients where, you know, initially they wanted to keep their will really simple didn't want to have trusts that seemed complicated. They could last for a long period of time. And I said, well, you spent a lot of years building wealth as a family. And there are scenarios that can happen. And you mentioned two. One is uh, marital breakdown. So the kids have spouses. Um, the family's built up wealth. And all of a sudden, your son-in-law or daughter-in-law now are part of that wealth distribution. And you don't want that to happen. So the trust helps to protect those assets. But the other one is um, your, your kids are in business. Uh, your daughter is married to someone who has a business, a plumbing company, whatever it is, and it becomes insolvent. So what you're saying is the trusts, if they receive assets from the estate, those are creditor proof. The family doesn't have to worry about those assets accessed by creditors. And, and so that, and that's a very much a COVID-19 moment. I mean, we talk about the impact economically and we've got families in this province who had great businesses that were doing very, very well. In the heartbeat of two months now, you know, things have changed. And so these kind of family conversations are really important. Um, there's a question that came in, great question. And either of you, maybe Christy, you can take a kick at this one and John, you can as well. Um, does a power of attorney provide for healthcare directives or are these completely separate? I had a doctor tell me that in Manitoba, my appointment as POA for my mother made me responsible for making a decision on a blood transfusion that was required. What's your feedback on that? So this is one thing, uh, the power of attorney documents and healthcare decision making matters does vary from province to province. Um, so this is where you wanna be careful that you are getting Manitoba specific documents. So in Manitoba, a power of attorney 
is its own document that only deals with finances and property and assets. The person appointed under that document only has ability to deal with your assets. There's a separate document that's called a healthcare directive, sometimes referred to as a living will, and that document will appoint a personal decision maker for medical and healthcare purposes. And from experiences we've heard from clients, um, I don't think doctors and healthcare professionals are always trained in the difference between those documents. So I, I have heard a number of times that um, you know, uh, family members are asked for a power of attorney to make healthcare decisions, and that's not even that's not the right document. It's a, it's a healthcare directive. So, um, yeah, I think there's a little education that does need to be done in um, for in the medical field too. But at least if if clients know what document is the right one, um, then they can be providing it to those individuals. Perfect. Here's a question for you. I, I experience this regularly through the year. Clients have wills. The wills are pretty up to date. Um, they have powers of attorney. But when it comes to healthcare directives, there seems to be uh, inertia, additional inertia that you fight through to get clients to actually engage in that particular conversation. What's your experience been as, as lawyers around healthcare directives? And have you experienced the same thing where people will get the power of attorney and will done, but the healthcare directives kind of, they're not as, uh, there's not a sense of urgency around that for some reason. I think, in, sorry, in my experience, um, for some reason, I think the healthcare directive maybe has its own, like the mortality of, of completing that is difficult for people. I find, um, so we have our own form that we'll prepare for clients. So if people ask me to do it, then it gets done. Um, but there, we also offer like there's different options available online. So I'll make people aware of those options. And often, you know, when they, we meet to sign the other stuff, uh, the health, the wills and the powers of attorney, I'll check in and, and see if they've done their healthcare directives. And often the answer is, oh no, we've been meaning to get to that, but you know, we haven't. And I get on them to do it. And um, but I, I don't know. I think it's something just in realizing your own mortality, maybe. <laughs> hmm. Any comments, John? In my experience has been that people rarely cry in my office. When I'm doing estate planning, they rarely cry in my office. But it's, uh, the only time they do cry is typically when we're talking about the healthcare directive. I have no idea why. We talk about dying. They go through it on a business-like basis. We have a nice time. They engage in conversation when making important decisions. They're grateful to be there and have that conversation. But as soon as I look them square in the chops and say, you might be in the hospital bed, you might be unable to make your decisions, family might have to step in and start making medical decisions for you. That will be the moment where some clients start to cry. There's something that, uh, that, that Chris and I have both observed, which makes the discussion around the health care directive more emotionally charged than other discussions that we typically have in our office. And we have some pretty emotionally charged discussions. So yes, it's a, a primary it's a real area for uh, procrastination. It's a real area where people, if they're going to get it done, need to ask the lawyer to get it done or at least be tough and, and, and uh, diligent in making sure they get it done themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's I, a, Go ahead, Krista. No, I just, I, it's kind of funny because of the three documents between the will, power of attorney, and healthcare directive, the healthcare directive is the only one that you don't actually need a witness on. So everyone sitting at home today could go online and print off um, like the, the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority has one form and you can sign that and fill that out and it would be a valid healthcare directive. So it's actually the easiest one for you to do, but for some reason, kind of the more difficult one to complete. I don't know. So this, I'm being a little bit selfish here. I'm going to lean into this topic a little bit because uh, what is the impact? So if I have a partner, I have a spouse, but no power, of, no healthcare director, or I have a health care directive. That's one scenario. The second scenario is I have no partner and I have no health care directive or I have a health care directive. So let's start with the, the spouse. I've got a partner, um, irrespective of what my health care directive says, is there any wiggle room? Um, is there a lack of clarity in terms of who the health care folks defer to in a situation where I can't advocate for myself in that moment? I've got a healthcare directive, but it seems to be contradictory to what my spouse or my partner would like to see happen. Have you seen circumstances like that? And if you have, how does that get adjudicated? I can start off on this one. So where you have a spouse and you also have a healthcare directive and the healthcare directive 
expresses contrary wishes to what the spouse is saying. So the healthcare directive would rule the day because that's the person's wishes that they've written out. Um, so that would be the document that you're following. With that being said, um, if the spouse was aware that that person had changed their mind on this particular issue and just hadn't updated the document or something to that effect, um, there is some wiggle room there. But if it's just a matter of, um, you know, the, the spouse that's incapacitated has said, I want the, pull pl the plug pulled in these circumstances, and the spouse is saying, no, I, I don't agree to that, you would follow the healthcare directive unless there was that contrary later intention from the person who's incapacitated. So usually the healthcare directive is going to rule the day on that side. And what was the second? Sorry, give me the second. The second, if, if I'm in the healthcare setting and I, what's the situation like compared not having a directive in that moment to having a directive? What are the practical differences? What, what issues get caused in that circumstance? Because obviously there's gridlock if you don't have it. What, what's, how do those things, those decisions get adjudicated in those circumstances if I have no healthcare directive? So if there's no healthcare directive, then it's the College of Physicians that has their own kind of policy on who they're contacting and who they take instructions from. Okay. So they have their own um, process, I guess, for, for going through that, which just means at the end of the day, you don't have control um, over those decisions or who's making those decisions. Um, so they'll have their own process that's followed. And then if you have your own healthcare directive, I mean, the next piece that's important is making sure that your close family members are aware of it and know where to find it and have it accessible when they have to actually run down to the hospital to make those decisions. I think that's a really, um, that's a really good point. And I think it ties to estate planning as well with your wills is what are your recommendations around safe custody of these important documents? And more importantly, if they need to be used, how do you communicate where these documents are? What do you recommend to your client families around, okay, we've got a will, but it's collecting dust in some safety deposit box someplace. And at the moment that we need it, people can't find it or they're not sure even if you have one. And the same thing with uh, healthcare directives or powers of attorney. What are your recommendations in terms of best practices? These are living documents that need to be acted on and used right away. What should they do? So first of all, store it in a safe place, something that's fireproof, waterproof, keep it somewhere safe. Um, one of the things we do to try and deal with this issue is whenever we prepare a package of documents, we've got everything signed, we prepare a location document. And so that'll just be like a one page uh, sheet that says I've signed wills dated this date, um, powers of attorney, etc. And they're being stored at X location. So it might be, it might name the branch that you have your safety deposit box at. Um, it might say in the safe at home. Um, it, it could have the combination for the safe that you're keeping the documents in. So we'll prepare that document and then you can give that out or even text a picture of it out to your kids or um, mm -hmm. appointed as executors, as attorneys, so that they know where to go looking. If you ever get in, um, you know, if you're hit by a car, right, that they know immediately where they're supposed to go for those documents. So that's what we try to do to mitigate that risk. Okay, perfect. Johnny, anything to add there? I've got lots of stuff to add on everything, but Chris is doing such a marvelous job. <laughs> so one of the things that I can add, one of the things I can add just because it's interesting is that, you know, the most three common storage locations are at home in a fireproof box or in a safety deposit box. That's number two. Number three might be at lawyer's office. We're trying to get a little bit away from that because no one seems to think to come ask us if we've got the document when someone passes away or loses capacity. Um, one of the funny things about storing at home is that uh, I've seen lots and lots of situations where they store the document at home and then the will maker gets old and the will maker starts to lose capacity and gets a little bit disorganized or confused. And they start scrawling things with a pen all over the original copy of the will. They write on it, I don't really like my friend Al anymore. Or they, or they start scribbling all over it as if they're changing it. Or they uh, or write a grocery list on it. Or they put it through the paper shredder. I've always said that if uh, if, if Wills have a natural predator. The natural predator is a senile will maker. The, the, the people go and destroy their wills with, with, or, or in, in, interfere with their wills with a shocking regularity. So for years, decades, I was saying, start at home, put it in a safety, in a fireproof box, we'll buy you one. Put it in a filing cabinet, 
let people know where it is. And now that I'm getting old and my clients are getting old, we're discovering as those wheels come out of the fireproof box, those wheels come out of uh, uh, the, the, the filing cabinet, they've been attacked by a predator. So uh, it's, it's, it's still a fine place to put it. I'm not trying to dissuade people from keeping your will at home. I'm just saying that there is some utility to maybe storing with the executor or storing in the safety deposit box, getting it away from the natural predator. Perfect. Good advice. Now, uh, some com questions have come in. By the way, thanks for sending in questions, uh, folks, because um, this makes it really practical. Here's a question for you. Either of you can take this on. Uh, can a sibling request inheritance money from her mother when we have power of attorney and a health care directive? Mother is in a nursing home. He has a will. We know the answer to that question, but you can take it on. Do you want to take a first step at it? Sure. So, um, can it's a child going to request money from her mother in nursing home? Yeah, from her mother who, um, and we, when we have a power of attorney and a health care directive, mother is in a nursing home. So, mother is getting care and they want to know if they can request inheritance money. <laughs> yeah. So, my, for, so initially I would say no, but reasoning behind that. So, um, if mom has capacity, so if mom did have capacity, she understands what she's doing and she wants to give money to her daughter, then I suppose in that case, yes, she's willing to make the gift um, and she's capable of making that gift and she can make the gift. If she doesn't have capacity, then you're looking to that power of attorney. So is there a power um, to support that daughter? Was she paying that daughter's rent? And there's a power for her to continue, um, for that attorney to continue to pay that rent. Um, so look to that power of attorney if there is a power there. And if not, that rule applies that um, the attorney can only use the money for the benefit of that incapacitated person. So, Do we lose John there? <laughs> yeah, I think we lost John. So Chris, it's just oh, you oh. and I. So okay. here's, here's, here's another question. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he must have had to take a bathroom break. So John, hopefully we'll be back soon. <laughs> so, oh, there he is. There he is. Okay. So okay. Here's, here's, the, uh, here's the second question. Um, healthcare directive form has very little guidance on how to complete and the form seems to assume you can anticipate all the variations of things that might happen. Is there guidance available online or do you need a professional to complete and help and anticipate the potential issue? Um, any guidance on that question? I'll take a kick at this and then I want to circle back and talk a little bit about the, the last question we had. The idea there is that uh, the general rule is you create a discretion in the part of the person who uh, you put in charge, and then they just have to make intelligent decisions and careful decisions as they go through. Um, so the general rule is you just let the person you appoint understand, maybe through a discussion, what your wishes and expectations are going to be, and then just ask them to use their discretion. Having said that, we do see power of attorney documents that have a lot of very specific clauses put into very specific issues, providing a lot of very specific guidance. The example of that, well, so we, we do see that. Um, so you can often get from a lawyer all of the, a lot of specific or customized language which might be used. <clears throat> Having said that, there is a, uh, uh, a doctor right now who's very active, and he's, I believe, got a website, and he's uh, put together. Um, he believes that people should, should very carefully uh, direct their mind to the language which is used. And he's trying to, to, to launch, I think, the product under which they can access language that, uh, to, that to be used for those purposes. Otherwise, there's not a lot of language out there. Um, I do know there was a consultant in Alberta who, who, special, who uh, spent a lot of time sitting down with people and helping them customize their, their, uh, their healthcare directive documents. So the, the, the short answer is there's not a lot of guidance out there in terms of specific language. Spe specific language can be useful and important. And um, if you uh, want, you can try to put it together yourself or through a uh, 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 assistance of a lawyer. Or you can tr go try to find one of those sources I described. But it's a, it's a bit of a desert. There's not a lot of guidance on that point. I'm wondering, uh, John, offline, if, if you had some ideas about resources when we sent out the link to the video recording, um, would it be possible to access potential resources out there online? Let's see what we can find. And I see if I can find that, uh, the, the material that that doctor circulated. Okay. We're pushing hard on this last year. Let me circle back to the point that I wanted to circle back to. And, 
one of the questions that came in was, if mom's in the personal care home, can mom make a gift? And Krista was exactly right, bang on. If mom still has some marbles, mom can do what she wants, and that includes making a gift. The mere fact that she happens to reside in a personal care home doesn't mean that she's mentally incapable. She might be physically incapable. And uh, at the other end of the spectrum, if she's mentally incapable and it's clear to everyone that she's mentally incapable, then absolutely not. A mentally incapable person cannot make gifts. It's illegal to support them. It's illegal for the power of attorney to try to do it for them. And gifts have to end when a person loses their capacity unless the power of attorney document contains a very specific clause allowing for gifts. Sometimes it says, uh, my attorney may make gifts and, and gives guidelines around that. So I gave you two examples. One where it's clear that gifts can be made because mom's completely capable, thank you very much. Another example where gifts cannot be made because mom's not capable, clearly not capable, and there's no language in the power of attorney to support it. We often, however, see situations which are halfway between the two, where there's some question of whether mom's capable or not. And mom's still signing checks and making gifts, and hundreds of thousands of dollars going out the door towards family members. And what that is, is just a recipe for litigation. It's a great opportunity for lawyers to make lots and lots of money because the number of fights we see between the, the beneficiaries of the ultimate estate and the person who's received the large gifts um, are just legion. Lots and lots of fights are on that topic. If someone was of partial capacity, halfway along that continuum, and wanted to make a gift, it is, and then they're smart enough, they'll engage lawyers to assess their capacity at the time to make the gift, bring in a doctor. Assess their capacity to make the gift. Create the evidence necessary to stop the fight in its tracks downstream when the fight uh, starts to boil up. Mm -hmm. what, what are the impacts for those of you, um, those people on the call who are subsequently watched the video, don't have a power of attorney. In the province of Manitoba, if you are, you're incapacitated, you, you should have a power of attorney so your family can act on your behalf. Um, if you don't have one, what are the ramifications and what are the steps so the family can act for you? I know that's not a situation we want to be in, but walk us through just a quick triage of what would need to happen. Chris, do you want to take that on? Sure. Okay. Um, so if you don't have a power of attorney in place, if you don't do that preparation, um, what will have to happen is someone who it wants to take over your property so the person who's willing to be that personal decision maker for you would have to apply to court and get appointed as your what's called a committee for property so you actually need a court order to appoint someone to take on that um, role of managing your property uh, so that process you know most lawyers i think charge a couple hundred dollars for a power of attorney a basic power of attorney to make that application to court. If you've got a lawyer doing that on your behalf, it's probably gonna be a few thousand dollars. So that's, I mean, that's one of the big reasons to, to do the power of attorney in advance to avoid, um, you know, the extra fees that could come in the future. I mean, if you, if you never lose capacity during life and there's never a short period of time where anyone has to act on your behalf, then maybe you never need the power of attorney, but it is a good insurance policy in case that ever happens. I heard, and I, I'm not sure, I think it was one of the lawyers at your firm said one of the challenges with um, cometeeship um, was, I think, built into that as an assessment process where the courts are trying to assess the person's current health and cognitive status. And that's actually a challenge to get the, the medical folks um, even to do those assessments. So they're actually bringing people from outer province into the province to do this. Is there any, is that happening still? There's a bit of a waiting list in terms of getting these assessments or is that backlog not an issue anymore? Any Don, can I speak to that one? Oh, oh you might be muted. Oh, there, there we go. Yeah. Um, the the process of having a committee appointed through a court process is never a convenient process. It does involve getting a report from a doctor, sometimes two reports from two doctors, as I understand it. And um, but my experience, of my, my, and I don't do that kind of court application, I only do fights, I don't do committee shifts. But my experience has been that the backlogs right now aren't too bad, that there generally are doctors available. But if it creates a, a month or two of delay, that's an awful, that seems like an eternity to a family who's waiting to step in and start writing checks and dealing with bills and that sort of business. So uh, a couple months delay is an eternity, and, but it is a couple months delay for sure. I'm not seeing people being brought in out of, out of province at this stage, however. 
Okay. Okay. John, a quick question for you. I know that you've trans your, your practice has kind of transitioned a little bit. Uh, when we first started working together, it was almost, I think it used to be wills, trusts, estate planning. And for an, a few years now, you've been doing estate litigation. I'm not sure if it's just estates or, or powers of attorney as well. But I think it's a really important area to briefly touch upon. It underscores the importance of a well-crafted document in this area. Um, why is there this bump up in litigation that's taking place out there in estates, trusts, um, for powers of attorney executors? And what can families do to defend themselves properly against potential litigation in their planning? I mean, the reason why there's a bump up is because we've got boomers uh, passing billions of dollars from one generation to the next right now. And uh, particularly at times when economic is, when the economy is in a downturn, people don't think themselves, well, I'll just go and make my own fortune. What they think is my mom and dad passed away. There's a million dollars there, or $2 million there, or $5 million there. And I've got to make sure I get my share. And so the uh, tendency to fight over money is because there's a lot of it there. And uh, particularly when there's an economic downturn, people tend to really fight and scra scrabble over their share of, the, of an estate or to try to reverse gifts made by a partially capacitated mother out of a personal care home, for example. So, uh, and, and one of the most important, you know, you need well-crafted documents. You should uh, um, um, be careful, make sure you use a lawyer who knows what they're doing, make sure that uh, things are done in a way which is going to stand scrutiny. You don't want stupid mistakes in the documents. Beyond that, and this harkens to one of the things we talked about a little bit earlier, is that a family conversation is often one of the most powerful ways to avoid litigation. And so if uh, mother passes away, and the wealth goes to say one child to the exclusion of two others. The first thing they do is they want to fight. The children have been disinherited. They want to fight over the, uh, the, the money that they're not getting. And what they say inevitably is the, the, the child who inherited must have put the parents under undue pressure. They must have done something sneaky and difficult, something sneaky and bastardly in order to have us disinherited so we didn't get our fair share. And so they hire lawyers and we go to court and we boldly fight like wild animals. I've got a, in a state fight in, uh, in uh, Alberta right now where uh, a blended family, a situation like this. And the parties have spent $2.5 million in legal fees over three years fighting over that estate. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, an economic Chernobyl for the uh, heirs who are watching the money uh, uh, disappear with, uh, with all of the lawyers fighting over it. So one of the ways of avoiding that is having a good family conversation. And the way you have a good family conversation is during the estate planning process, um, the parents sit down with the children and say, for the example I'm giving, we are leaving our wealth to one of you, not to the other two. And we want to explain why we're doing that. It's not because that child has put us under pressure. It's not because that child has tricked us or misled us. It's because of, and then they fill in some different reasons. I did a family conference once with, uh, in that exact situation where all the wealth was being given to, left to a son in Manitoba, not to two daughters in Ontario. And we got all the three kids together. And it was a wonderful thing. The three kids and the parents. And the parents looked at the two daughters and said, we're so proud of you. You've done so well. We're leaving the money to our son because he hasn't had the same opportunities. He needs the money. And the two daughters said, that's A-OK. -okay. Thank you for explaining it. We'll know what to expect. We completely endorse it. The son was the one who was trying to push back because he didn't want to feel, he didn't feel right about taking it. And when those parents died, smooth sailing. If we hadn't had that family meeting, we would have had litigation. And since the family had money, it might have been one of those great litigation cases where we were able to bill collectively as a uh, pile of lawyers several hundred thousand dollars, or God forbid, two or three million. So family meetings are a very powerful way of avoiding family fights, and good, well-drafted documents are also a bulwark in avoiding litigation. Hmm. Any comments to add there, Krista, at all? No, I think John said it. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a good strategy to avoid litigation. Um, yeah, even just I'll sit down with clients sometimes and talk through uh, the plans, like when we've got trusts and things that we're doing just to bring in the trustees that are expected to be acting and review, okay, this is what your role is going to be. This is how the trust works, just so we can clear up any um, questions or issues that might come up that um, in talking with the trustees, we didn't come up and talk, like, that didn't come up in talking with the uh, clients that were setting these, up these structures. So it's a good strategy for sure. Well, we've, we're coming up on the hour, and so um, 
we've gone through the questions that have come up on the feed for the webinar. So thank you everyone for uh, who gave us some questions to throw to Krista and John. Um, so I think I'm just going to kind of close out the webinar today. I'm just going to make a few comments. And if Krista and John have any concluding comments as well, um, they can feel free to do that. So a couple of things. Uh, the family meeting idea, I think is a great idea. Uh, it's been really championed by a lot of law firms, including traditional law is a really important precursor step to making sure everyone's on the same side of the song sheet, so to speak. Uh, when we post this uh, video, we'll include links to resources that we have uh, that actually help clients facilitate that conversation. So if you haven't had a family meeting, you're wondering how to set it up, uh, some basic conversation starters, uh, areas to talk about as a family, um, I think it's great. And particularly if you have adult kids, adult kids are reluctant. They're not going to drive that conversation, but they feel there's important things to talk about. So for parents, it's a great thing to instigate. And I think you'll find that your, your kids will be very open to that conversation. And so courses will kind of give you some ideas about how to set that conversation up and to lean into some really important uh, questions. Um, in terms of uh, traditional law, I know I'll make a couple of quick comments. If any of you are prompted to want to take some action, so you've got healthcare directive, powers of attorney, an estate plan that maybe is not up to date, in the midst of this uncertainty, this crazy period with COVID-19, um, but you're anxious to maybe dust off some of these documents and make sure that they're, they're really doing what they should be doing, then I would encourage you to uh, reach out to John and Krista at Traditional Law. As well, they've graciously offered to do estate planning updates. So if you're not clients, uh, but you're looking for someone to give you a bit of a second opinion on your current drafting of estate documents in this area, what they'll do is a, a memo to file, they'll review the documents and give you some ideas about how you can improve your planning in that area. And like uh, they said right at the beginning, they're trying to be very flexible and accommodating during this very unique period that we're in right now. Any concluding comments, Krista, John? I guess just one thing we didn't end up touching on was signing documents. So when it comes down to the final stage, whenever if you're doing any updates or doing your first round of estate plan documents, um, there are some different options for signing. I mean, I don't know what all other firms are doing, but for us, um, clients that are still comfortable meeting in person, we can either do meetings at the office and we're following a sanitization procedure for that. Uh, we're going to clients' homes and setting up um, tables, you know, on their front porch and having uh, step-up signings so that we're still keeping our physical distance from one another. But we're in the same um, location and physically presence as we're supposed to be for signing those documents. And there's some other options even for, for will signings. If it's just a will update, um, there can be some options doing things over video too. So we can talk through that if, if that's an issue for clients as well. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Krista. John, any final concluding comments? Well, just uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate in this process today. The primary goal and objective is always to make sure things are done well and go smoothly so there's never the need to fight. So if the need to fight ever arises, we're there for that. But we're here today to talk about ways to keep away from the fight. And uh, if people procrastinate, it's human. If you're sitting while uh, watching the screen, during this presentation, during this webinar, um, and you haven't done your documents yet, you're uh, in good company. Or if your documents are done a long time ago and you know you should look at them, you're still in good company. But now we have a real reason to avoid procrastination. The COVID-19 thing, it's real. I mean, you, different people have different levels of fear around it, but it's real. And maybe it's now time to start looking at your state planning again. Just saying. Thank you. Perfect. So again, a big thanks to Krista and John uh, for participating in this webinar. Again, this is our ongoing attempt to kind of reach out to everyone to keep the important conversations going and, and adding a little bit of value uh, back to your circumstances. Uh, stay tuned for another email we'll be going out to. We're hosting a webinar next Tuesday at 10, 10 a.m. again. And we have holistic nutritionist Jody Lee uh, giving us a, a really, really great talk on, on our health and staying healthy during times of stress. I know you really enjoyed that particular webinar as well. So thanks everyone for participating. Again, thanks, John. Thanks, Krista.